Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Gerald Vernon Jackson. I'm leader of Portsmouth City Council and chair of the uh, Culture, Tourism and Sport Board at the Local Government Association. Um, so welcome to this. I'm delighted to welcome you here today to this joint webinar with the Football Foundation. Um, football is regarded as our national sport. It's a fantastic team activity that brings people from different backgrounds together to exercise, to socialise and interact and to keep fit. In the context of COVID, it can help build resilience to the virus and to other infections or illnesses such as diabetes and heart disease. Whilst participation figures for many of the highest uh, are, are among the highest of any sport, whether playing or a spectator, there are still areas where councils and football providers can work more closely to bridge the gaps that exist. For example, inequalities in coaching structures among people from different backgrounds, gender, disability and ethnicity remain a challenge for many sports, including football. Within this football revolution, we would like to see the inequality gaps reducing and eventually removed. However, it's our infrastructure that is crucial to ensuring future levels of participation and enjoyment and success for our national teams in the future. And this is where councils have a crucial role to play in partnering with the Football Foundation and our local leagues. And I know when I have moans um, from my local um, teams, it's almost always about pitches. Um, in the current financial climate, it's crucial that we see a more coordinated, localised approach to sports funding and provision. I'm therefore delighted that we're working with the Football Foundation through this webinar to ensure that resources are maximised and a seamless football offer is presented to participants to take part at whatever level they choose. The Football Foundation is the Premier League, the FA and the government's charity. Over the past 20 years, it's been working with communities to deliver sports projects worth over £1.5 billion. This reflects a long-term commitment to championing fair access to quality facilities for all players, regardless of their age, gender, background or ability. Today, we'll hear uh, about plans to ensure every community gets the football facilities they deserve. These plans present a huge opportunity to transform local grassroots sports across England and secure the benefits it will bring to our communities. I'm sure you'll, be, you'll find today useful in unlocking the funding uh, you need to transform your local pitches and deliver the local football, football facilities plans. I'm particularly pleased because I've seen previous investment by the Football Foundation in Portsmouth. And I've seen the huge effect that's had. And I'm really interested to hear from other people who've seen the next wave uh, and seen the effects in their communities, as I hope Portsmouth will be getting um, some of these facilities in the near future. So it's now my pleasure to pass on to Martin Glenn, Chair of the Football Foundation. Martin, hello, and thank you for all your work. Gerald, good morning. And uh, if we can see your Portsmouth shirt, that'd be an added, added bonus to the uh, thank you well, to the day. It's always an added bonus to see a Pompey shirt. <laughs> yeah, you don't see many of them, that's for sure. Anyway, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today. And I'm delighted we've got well over 200 people from local authorities, community sports organisations across the country coming together today with a common purpose. Each of us has got an important part to play in unlocking the power of football investment to transform lives in our communities. And I'd like to start with some really good news. We've now completed our two year quest to create local plans that's going to help every community across England get the football facilities they deserve over the coming years. For the first time ever, we've got a roadmap to invest and build in what every community needs through what we call our local football facility plans. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how they've been created and what they mean for all of us this morning. But before that, I'd just like to share a short film explaining the mission and the work of the Football Foundation. From Hackney to Hartlepool, we've been transforming football facilities so more people can play more football. Then, overnight, everything changed. 
the pitches went quiet and the players stayed home. But while the world stopped, we never stopped believing in the power of the pitch. Because this is about far more than just football. It's about improving physical and mental health. About strengthening communities and boosting the local economy. So let's keep going. Let's work together to transform grassroots football. Let's create the pitches that change lives. As the film showed, the Football Foundation, the Premier League, the FA and government have a long-term commitment to championing fair access to quality facilities for all players, regardless of age, gender, background or ability. About 1.8 million people normally participate in some form of football each week, and that's supported by another 1.5 million volunteers. We all know our national games played an important role in communities in offering great opportunities for everybody to get involved in physical activity and therefore creating a wide range of positive outcomes. And the foundation over the last 20 years has been working with communities up and down England to deliver sports projects worth over 1.5 billion pounds because we know good quality facilities enable and promote greater football participation. Often the sites we invest in don't just include football pitches. Many feature gyms or community spaces and other sports facilities, all of which bring people together to create new opportunities and build community cohesion. Well-managed facilities can become long-term revenue generators and represent a really good use of capital investment. According to CEBR, for every one million pounds of capital we invest in community facilities, 5.5 million of output is supported in the wider economy. That's a great multiplier. So by creating better access to quality facilities, we'll get more people playing our national game. And we know that playing football improves lives by promoting physical and mental health and empowering young people and strengthening communities. And communities need this more than ever. COVID-19 is the biggest public health challenge we've faced in generations. And whilst grassroots football is again on a necessary pause, it will be back soon. And we'll need football to help communities get back on their feet and to make them more resilient. In 2017, whilst I was CEO of the FA, we created what's called the National Football Facilities Strategy to set a framework for long-term investment. We recognised this had to be underpinned by practical plans that reflected the diverse needs and differences of every local authority, which is why we then created local football facilities plans. And we've been working for over the past two years with FA, local authorities and communities to create plans for every area in England. And they've been produced in collaboration with local stakeholders who provided crucial knowledge about current football provision and the likely demand for future facility developments. Over 2,000 clubs have been consulted, more than 300 local authorities and a range of other stakeholders to identify an excellent and exciting pipeline of projects. Each local plan is a short, well-defined document that captures current football facilities and identifies investment priorities where the needs are greatest. They will help us improve grass pitches, develop changing rooms, expand pavilions and create new 3G pitches, as well as introducing small-sided facilities. And they strike a nice balance between enabling the traditional 11-a-side game to keep that robust was catering for the rising demand in different football formats amongst young people, disability, um, dis disabled players and older generations. We expect 90% of Football Foundation funding will support the delivery of projects in these plans. And to secure that funding, each project will need to follow an application process to demonstrate it will deliver key participation outcomes and that can become sustainable and this then is backed by long-term match funding. We know it's a formula that works. And through the Football Foundation, the Premier League, the FA and government, there are committed funds to deliver this ambition. 
And what now we want to do is work with local authorities and community organisations whose facilities have been identified as a priority project to turn them into reality. At the foundation, we understand the huge pressure local authorities are under right now in making difficult financial decisions and how to meet short-term needs created by COVID, as well as delivering against your longer-term strategies. And we believe investing in local community facilities, football facilities, can help deliver valuable health, social and economic outturns. Many of you are looking to integrate physical activity into more proactive public health policies. Local health and wellbeing strategies across England consistently highlight physical inactivity as a major challenge. And there's evidence to show that investing in local football facilities will increase participation, and that is an effective way to tackle this. Football is one of the most effective forms of exercise. Recreational footballers are often fitter and healthier than participants in other sports such as tennis and swimming. For older people, participation in walking football has been shown to help increase bone strength and balance better than walking or even resistance training. There are many popular versions of football, especially modified for people with disabilities to help them get involved in sport and to get more active. And by increasing self-esteem and providing a sense of achievement, football helps improve emotional and social well-being of people with mental health problems. Participation in football and other team sports has been proven to boost educational attainment by as much as 29% for young people with low numeracy and reading comprehension. As well as funding from the Premier League and the FA, we provide access to central government money for community football facility investment. In addition to our collective funding, it's estimated that the cost of building all the facilities needed by communities across England is going to require an additional £2 billion of investment. And to help unlock this investment, we need to work more closely with local authorities and partners to deliver it. And we appreciate the funding structures for local authority investment can be complicated with different departments looking to fund different outcomes. But I think combining budgets for health, and well-being, youth provision, community cohesion and other funding streams can be a really effective way of securing the investment required to match community funding football facilities, to match fund, sorry, to match fund community football facilities. Wherever we invest we, with funding from applicants and I'm delighted to say you'll soon be hearing from two of our local authority partners who have invested alongside the Football Foundation and delivered great outcomes. Councillor Louise Gittins will talk about the difference that our partnership has made to the people of Chester and West Cheshire. And Councillor Graham Miller will be sharing his experience of working with us to create the local largest local community football investment for the North East, which has been used to build a series of hubs across Sunderland. Both will demonstrate how working in partnership with us to invest in local football facilities can help transform the lives of local people by improving their physical and mental health strengthen communities and empower younger generations and if you've got questions on the plans or how you can work with the football foundation or um, more generally our interim ceo robert sullivan will soon be joining the panel discussion and can take those questions and add huge value let me close by saying that i passionately believe in the power of pictures and i'm really excited by the opportunity of working with you to ensure that every community every community gets the football facilities that they deserve. I really believe that investing in local facilities will deliver these valuable health, social and economic outturns and make our communities more robust and make England a better place to live and grow up in. And growing football in your communities is going to be vital to help them get back on their feet after the ravages of COVID-19 and make them more resilient into the future. We at the Football Foundation are, are here to help your, your exciting football plans, your exciting local facilities plans become a reality. Let's now start conversations and work together. Now, before I leave, I'd like to hand the last word to one of our ambassadors, and it's somebody who knows a little bit about more football than I do. 
I'm delighted to announce that the Football Foundation have finalised their local football facility plans. This is a culmination of a study on every area of the country and seeing where their needs are the most for new football pitches, uh, improved football pitches or improved football facilities across the board. Of course we know the impact on the local community of having those facilities. We know that the power of football to be able to bring communities together, to bring people from every background of every age and impact positively on their mental and physical health is so powerful in the communities that they live. The Football Foundation in collaboration with the Premier League, the Football Association and the government are now in a position to be able to push these plans forward. So that football family coming together, particularly at a time when we're having to deal with COVID and the restrictions and the problems that's bringing to our communities and what we've now got to do is work together to provide those facilities for people which have never been more important. So I'm looking forward to playing my part in that and I hope that you will do as well. Martin, thanks very much indeed for that. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, um, I'm sorry I should have said at the beginning um, that uh, if you've got questions for the speakers, and we've got a really good panel later, um, can you put your questions in the Q&A bit, which you'll find at the, the bottom of your screen? Um, you've also got the ability to upvote questions you think are good um, so that they get close to the top and have a better chance of being asked. Um, and all the speaker presentations will be made available on the LGA website after this event. So, Martin, thanks very much indeed uh, for that. Um, we can now go to Tim Hollingsworth, uh, the Chief Executive of Sport England. Tim, welcome. It's lovely to see you. Um, and the floor is yours. Go off mute. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Gerald, very much for that. Uh, and um, just struck, actually, that uh, you know that you're a famous person in the world being the England manager when the video doesn't play, but still everyone recognises who it is that's, that's speaking. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to talk to you all today. I'm here with a couple of hats on, primarily as the Chief Executive of Sport England, uh, but also very much as a trustee of the Football Foundation, part of Martin's uh, board. And while it is absolutely central government and the DCMS who are the funding partner and providing the resources uh, for uh, the Football Foundation, it's uh, through Sport England that the money flows. And it's very much, hopefully, our connection and our engagement, not least with so many of you on the call today that can help uh, make uh, some of these amazing plans more of a reality because it is a great partnership actually um, and it's one of the reasons why I was so keen to join you and follow on from Martin today. Um, I think generally uh, we have and are building uh, a relationship with many local authorities and with the LGA and uh, many of you I hope on this call will have uh, experienced in recent years the intent that Sport England has uh, to work in local places and understand the local challenges and particularly engage with you as authorities. Um, but also recognising just how much you're all doing, not only to ensure that the opportunity is there for every person to play football, uh, but also that our great national game is driving, as Martin suggested, the health and well-being and recovery of communities across England. Um, and it's a partnership, as I say, I think it's becoming increasingly important uh, to Sport England. Um, and to me, uh, and I only say that, it's a, a moment of reflection for me. It's actually my uh, second anniversary of joining Sport England uh, two years ago. Um, but first, I think I need to, uh, I'd like to sort of start with a, a universal truth, because if you say it, it sounds obvious, but it's worth saying anyway, football is hugely important. It plays a very significant role in the lives of individuals. It helps to shape the identity and sense of belonging we feel for the places that we live, that we work and that we play. Um, I think this is true um, in what we might describe as peacetime, <laughs> but certainly during the current period, during the COVID pandemic, I think the, the value of football, the unique value of football actually, has become more undeniable. If you open any newspaper or listen to any radio broadcast in recent weeks, then there is a real fervour for both the return of the professional game, um, and obviously we've had recent internationals as well, and indeed public concern, I think, um, which we share for the fate of local clubs, their governance, children's participation, access to local parks, leisure centres and other spaces where we can be active and play the game. 
And I think uh, for me, uh, the reality of the current time we'll all understand is, is not great. Having managed to get uh, some return to the community game after the first lockdown, the complete restriction now on outdoor team sports in this period is a bit of a setback. Um, we're doing everything we can to argue the case for a very swift return. I'm sure many of you will be too within the context locally, but it must be set, of course, in the context of the wider response to the pandemic and nothing at all is certain in that context. So, as will be the case, I'm sure, throughout the day, there are some negatives here to consider, but uh, there are also opportunities, there are also positives. I'm delighted uh, in the way that Martin was able to describe some of the work that's carried on even during the, 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 the period of the last six, seven months. I think we've also seen very directly some incredible examples of local communities mobilizing to support their neighborhoods through sport. Um, we have a lot of evidence now, both anecdotal and, uh, and um, from our surveys, that when the first main lockdown was introduced, because physical activity and exercise was specified as one of the four reasons that people could leave their homes, although they couldn't play the sport, it really did engage local clubs. Clubs reached out, provided support and information to their members to do just that, to remain physically active. And we've seen an increase too in the use of digital platforms and technology to stay connected, even to support in many cases, qualification and development of officials and other elements of sports governance. And indeed, I know of some sports where they've had online AGMs in the last few months that have attracted a hundred times the number that they'd get to a, to a real event. Um, there are some upsides to these endless Zoom calls. So, you know, sport is connected in a way that few other activities can actually. And uh, very striking that volunteers who would normally give their time running their sports, coaching, have actually turned it to serving their local communities and were very prominent in providing food and providing support, even a friendly face uh, to people in their local areas. Football clubs were part of that, absolutely. So today I know that everyone's joined this, um, this virtual room because we want to try and harness that enthusiasm and that desire to be connected, to, be, to create together, I think, um, that dreaded phrase of a, a new normal, because we share a belief, as Martin has already outlined, in the transformative power of sports generally and football particularly to bring people and places together with a common purpose. I think this should be today our collective opportunity. There's no doubt that community sports organisations, while they are in some cases finding life very difficult right now in the very short term with the financial pressures that they face and the opportunities that they lack in terms of you know, providing the sport that they love, they do have a significant role to play in rebuilding the health and prosperity of our nation. Sport and physical activity is a high performing and well in well evidenced investment and it's essential to our recovery I think in every part of England and every bit of the country that you all are, uh, are responsible for. We have some interesting recent independent research it was undertaken for us by Sheffield Hallam the university which estimates that for every pound invested community sport and physical activity returns three pounds 91 of uh, return in economic and social value. And in real terms, the sorts of things that we should and could be focusing on, the ability to get people moving means resu results in 30 million fewer GP visits, prevents falls that lead to 21,000 fewer hip fractures and reduces many other burdens on public services. So there's an argument for moving just beyond the sport. An active nation also reduces workplace absenteeism, absenteeism it increases productivity, and indeed, we believe it adds nearly 14 billion to the UK's economy. And those are important numbers and they're important to us and to, to government at this time. But I think the case for investment also matters just as much to individuals as it does to our GDP. Our active lives and COVID track, tracker surveys have shown us that while there was a great enthusiasm initially for staying active, activity levels now are dropping. There are three million fewer adults being active uh, compared to this period last year. Perhaps not surprising, but still very significant fact that 3.4 million people are now classed as inactive, that is doing less than 30 minutes a week and experiencing more anxiety and loneliness and, and worse health as a result. And we know, and you will all know, 
that the pandemic is not equitable. It's making it harder for some communities and some demographics to be active than others. Adults from less affluent backgrounds have had fewer opportunities, time and resource to be active. People with disabilities and long-term health conditions, 16 to 34 year olds and indeed older adults and those from Asian and black ethnic backgrounds in particular have also affected, been affected negatively more than other groups. And I think it's frankly unacceptable that the people who can benefit most from the health and mental well-being benefits of activity are also currently the least likely to experience them. So in these circumstances, I think we share a responsibility. We have it at Sport England, but I think we collectively share it to help those individuals and communities to tackle this challenge. So I am genuinely uh, welcoming the fact that we can, Sport England and other partners like the Football Foundation, start to champion the role of sport and activity in everyone's lives. And we're getting close now to, to coming to publishing a, our new strategy, which will be due in the new year. I know many of you will have had the opportunity to consider that. Uh, final stage consultation is out at the moment. And as we do, as we get closer to that, the clearer it becomes that, you know, we do need to be disproportionate in who we focus on and who we help. To us, it's not just enough that we recover, we must reinvent how sport and activity, how football is delivered in our communities. We've seen this already through some great place-based investments in that everyone benefits from being active, is part, allowing everyone to benefit is part of how systems thinking locally is starting to be delivered. And my colleague, Chris Perks, uh, who many of you will know, is on the panel coming up shortly to talk more about that. Because we do need to make sure that we're not only providing the opportunity for people to enjoy their sport, but also feel the health improvement benefits that can flow from it. So if you take nothing else away from me today, at least, on the back of how Martin introduced the, uh, the great work that the foundation has been doing, it should be that we can and should choose to help people to be active in ways that will create the kind of society that we want to live in. And football holds a particular special place in that, in our national culture, and I think it has a significant role to play in catalyzing this change. I mentioned um, uh, uh, before in a, in a recent, uh, uh, another recent platform that it's actually one of the six major activities, the major, major ways that people are active in this country. And it's the only sport which can be really categorized in that way in a formal, traditional, organized way. Uh, foot, uh, alongside running, walking, swimming, cycling, and gym and fitness, football is one of the six major ways that people in this country choose to be active. Last year, 1.9 million people played football regularly. The team, uh, the sport has the highest participation levels of any team sport. And in particular, it has the highest level of activity and participation among adults from disadvantaged backgrounds. So I'm delighted that Sport England is working closely with the foundation and the government and our other partners on the development of the local football facilities plans and that Martin has been able to announce their completion today and the voice of Southgate has you know, come in on behind, it, uh, behind that. Um, and as I'm really looking forward to hear at the moment, there's been great examples from local facilities that have strengthened our communities, not least in Cheshire and in Sunderland. Because ultimately, community assets, like purpose-built facilities, like leisure centres, like schools and the parks, are a necessary precondition for proper community development. Pitches, are the places that people come to mix, to integrate, and sometimes even to share in each other's challenges and each other's victories. They facilitate local cooperation and partnership, and they can help bridge the gap between the haves and the haves nots. In some places, these needs will be met with smaller scale investments that support the potential for more informal games, as Martin suggested. In others, association football size pitches will be needed to host larger scale competitive leads. But it also shouldn't necessarily be a choice between funding different kinds of sports or activities, because many of these new facilities and pitches can be mixed use, allowing different sports to cohabit, share the resources and respond more appropriately to the needs and lives of their users. Indeed, I would suggest that this kind of multi-sport approach, maximising investment and use, is the future. So certainly in Sport England, we hope that high quality facilities can and will reach into the very heart of places and their communities and help to restitch some of our fraying social fabric. Even during these difficult times, my colleagues and I are ambitious about the role that sport and moving more, that playing can play in the lives of our communities and in the fight against COVID. 
As a trustee of the Football Foundation, I know we share this vision and I'm proud to be working in close collaboration with you all in your local places to help unlock the potential of our national game. I'm very confident that the local football facilities plans announced today will help to provide a further blueprint for what we can achieve together and how we can further cement the role of football in the activity of the nation. So thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Martin, um, for everything that you're doing. And thank you, Gerald, indeed, for the leadership you're showing among our partners in the local authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. That, that's very kind. Um, colleagues, we now have um, two uh, people coming to talk to us uh, with case studies of what's worked really well in their local areas. So I'm really pleased to be able to welcome uh, Councillor Louise Gittings, the leader uh, of Cheshire West and Chester, um, who's going to talk to us about the, the work that's happened there and the transformation it's made in her community. Uh, Louise, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you very much, Gerald. Um, just one moment while I uh, share the screen. Um, and we shall get this going. There we go. So, um, hello everybody. I'm Louise Gittins. I'm leader of Cheshire West and Chester Council. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to talk about our journey with our football facilities plan. And I think this couldn't come at a more important time as we recover from COVID and how we can use um, sport and physical activity to help us all as we move forward. Um, we, we all know the impact that um, uh, COVID has had both on our physical and the mental well-being of our, our communities. Um, but it's not just um, the, the actual process of playing football, it's about people coming together, giving a sense of purpose and not normality and it offers uh, regular access to a support network which has never been more needed than it is now. It also promotes cohesion integration and it provides, particularly for young people, a range of skills um, that will be vital to success in later life. I'm really keen as well that we get more girls and women involved and uh, hopefully the um, story that I tell you will, will show how that this has happened in Cheshire West. Um, as, as leader of the council when I was elected uh, last year, I wanted to keep well-being in my portfolio because um, for me it's sort of at the heart of everything that we're doing and um, certainly um, our, our vision in Cheshire West and Chester Council is about uh, uh, reducing health inequalities and improving the health and well-being of everybody within our borough. Um, but it's not just about health and well-being, we've heard about the impact on the um, economy and also it's about climate emergency and by encouraging more people to get active there'll be a, a greater focus I hope on active travel and living healthier um, lifestyles altogether. So um, in terms of our approach and how we, we, we went um, about our football facilities plan we've been doing this now for about two, two years and the, the biggest part of it is partnership working. This couldn't work without partnerships and um, our particular partnerships are um, obviously Football Foundation, but also Cheshire FA, Active Cheshire, the Sports England, and really importantly, our grassroots football teams right across the borough and our local communities. But it's also about council teams working together so that we don't just work in silos, we take a, a whole sort of council approach to this. So far, we've um, invested about £2 million, and this has been match funded by the Football Foundation, but we've also brought in external um, sources of funding and local um, communities raising money as well. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and this is, for me, it's just been something that has been so exciting as, as we've moved forward. So I want to just share with you some of our um, pro projects that we've been involved with. So this is the first one. And um, this, uh, you can see on the goalposts there, all the metal flaking off. This is a football pitch in Ellesmere Port called Netherpool. And um, we wanted to, it was on our um, playing pitch strategy, our football um, uh, pitches strategy for, for improvements. Um, so this shows you what was happening um, during it. So it was leveled out, it was reseeded. There was um, new goals, we put in spectator fences and new changing facilities and it cost about £140,000 
and this is what it looks like now and if, if you you know go back to that previous picture this is such an improvement to the whole sort of condition um, of, of the pitch. The next one is Knight's Grange in Winsford and again you see horrible old grotty rusty um, posts worn out area around the goal mouth and here you can see the the condition of the grass which was like that all over um, and again this has been totally um, transformed Another one, um, this particular pitch was in one of our uh, uh, poorer areas of, of Ellesmere Port, real health inequalities in this area. And again, it was this is one of the pitches subject to flooding and actually it wasn't used because it was flooded and muddy for most of the year. So local residents just weren't using it at all. So we um, did a huge drainage scheme on this. Um, you can see the work undergo being uh, undertaken there. And this is what it looks like um, afterwards. And already we're, we're starting to see just for recreational use, um, people are starting uh, to use it again, which is great news. So they're, they're examples of some of the um, grass improvements, the sort of the, the low level improvements, if you like. Um, and I want to just share a couple of other ones. Um, so this is um, Helsby High School 3G and pitch and changing facilities. And this is a great collaboration really driven forward by one of our grassroots team which was Frodsham um, Junior Football Club and this is about uh, 1.2 million pounds of investment um, and Frodsham Juniors themselves actually raised nearly 100,000 pounds towards this and um, interestingly I was just tweeting um, that I was doing this today and they've, they've sent me a, a tweet um, a, and a quote and what they're saying is better facilities for grassroots clubs such as ours will boost particip participation, mental health and physical well-being. Having a home for our club will allow us to increase our offerings across the extended community. And I think that this is a, a great example of where so many different partners have come together for a fantastic facility. Um, I also want to share, share another one. This is um, Winsford Academy. Um, this was a, a different way actually of funding something. So the money from this came from a capital um, receipt and um, we've, it's enabled us to um, have this fantastic 3G um, pitch facility. Um, that opened about <clears throat> 18 months ago. So um, it's not just about the money that we're getting from Football Foundation, it's looking at other sources of money to build on the work that you've done. Um, we've got currently, we're working with um, Chester uh, FC Community Trust for a brand new facility in um, Blaken, which will bring 3G changing facilities. And that's of an, an investment of about £1.5 million. And we're delighted that um, there will be uh, Football Foundation money going into that. It is going to uh, planning, so I don't want to preempt the planning deci decision next week, I think, but we're really excited about that. <clears throat> so I suppose the big question is, um, so what, you know, what does all this investment actually do? Um, and we're, we're now, as I said before, in the second year of a three-year football investment programme. And um, it's, I think, really important for us that we can see what impact this is ma um, making. Um, we currently have, in terms of purely football perspective, um, over uh, about 864 teams that train and play in the borough. Um, and that's in addition to 56 teams that play in the Cheshire Girls League at Moss Farm in Northwich. And in just two seasons, and with alongside this work that's um, been ongoing, we've increased the amount of teams by um, over 100. Um, and it's continuing to grow. So it's having a massive impact in terms of participation. And what I'm really keen to see is how um, this impacts on people's um, uh, health and, and well-being. And I'm really keen um, that we work with uh, one of our local universities to actually get some evidence uh, around this to see the impact it's making. So if, you, if you're not yet involved, you're watching this, um, make sure, get your playing pitch strategy sorted and work with the Football Foundation because it is transforming our communities. And it's a really exciting project. It's something positive. 
um, as we go forward out of COVID. And I'm happy to answer any questions when we come to the end of that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very, very much, Louise. And um, that was really interesting for those of us who, who are hoping to be get, this, get this investment in the future. Um, our programme says we've now got um, Graham Miller, who's the leader of Sunderland. Unfortunately, Graham can't be with us, uh, but Victoria French um, from Sunderland Council um, is here to again tell us her experience of, of how it works on the ground. So, Victoria, thank you very much for stepping in at such short notice, and we'd love to hear about what's happening in Sunderland. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I've just jumped off the sub bench for this. So um, just want to kind of take you through uh, our journey that we've had with, with key stakeholders, including Sport England and the Football Foundation. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. So this image will be very familiar to people and we've seen similar images in presentation so far. Like many other local authorities, we've seen some significant budget reductions since 2010. And at that time, we recognised that to continue to make the scale of cuts that were required, we needed to further modernise and transform the services in a way that would make them sustainable for the future. Conversations with funding partners started over four years ago, and today we have three of the best, and I would probably say, if not the best, football hubs within the, within the country. If you could move to the next slide, please. So the three hubs, which one which you can see here, are all located in some of our most challenging areas. Next slide. The hubs have, or we have, 10 full-size 3G pitches, one of which is rugby compliant and one step five stadia pitch. We've got three full-size grass pitches, a health and fitness facility, community spaces and cafes, spaces for education and training, and very, very crucially, hundreds of car parking spaces. I cannot underestimate the need for these. Next slide, please. So this slide here just details some of the numbers um, from the first year. And you can see from these, who, the people who've accessed the facilities and what has been the most challenging opening year that we could have anticipated, the numbers have been significant. And it just shows us that this was very much needed and it was definitely worth the investment um, that we had and, and the funding that we received um, thankfully from the, the, the stakeholders. So we're confident that when the facilities can reopen and we'll see this momentum pick back up, we saw it very recently in the stop start approach that we've had to have in the last several months, but we're confident um, that the numbers will pick back up and, and achieve um, the, the plans that we'd set out. Next. It was obviously hugely important for our city that even during the most challenging times financially that we look to invest in community football facilities and I think across across all of the people who we've worked with I think we'd say that if we were starting our journey again it would be more essential than before as part of our COVID-19 recovery plans. So football plays a positive role in many people's lives in Sunderland. It's valued in its own right for the friendship, fun, challenge and enjoyment it brings. However the benefits of sport and physical activity go far beyond the sporting arena. We believe that football also has the power to change communities. We're seeing it happen now. It helps places thrive. It brings people together and break down barriers and help to build communities. And this hasn't, has never been more important than it is today. Furthermore, football can play a key part in helping us live longer, as has been previously said, and helping us live healthier and more active lives. All of these points are embedded in our approach in Sunderland to being a dynamic, vibrant and healthy city. And our residents and visitors to Sunderland now have access to excellent quality local facilities that benefit a wide range of stakeholders far beyond just the players. Next slide, please. So a key priority for the city remains to increase participation in sport and physical activity year on year. The Sport England Active Life Survey identifies that football is one of the highest participation activities locally and football provides opportunities to engage with residents of all ages, abilities and disabilities in playing, volunteering, coaching and spectating. As we did in 2016, we still recognise that continuing to invest in football and football facilities can play a significant role in helping improve health and mental well-being for so many people. But we know it also has the potential to support the economy and enable better outcomes for young people. It's never been more important for us in Sunderland to have well-managed facilities. 
the new model that we now have in place will allow for the revenues generated by the football hubs to help cross subsidise improvements in the remaining grass pitches within the city. Our strategic thinking recognises that we need to continue to find new solutions, test boundaries, co-produce and work collaboratively with stakeholders and funders as we're committed to further develop our local plan for football that is very much in line with local and national priorities. The Football Foundation, Sport England, our local county FA are absolutely key to this and although we've got these fantastic facilities we're not stopping here. This is just the start of what we hope is a, is a fantastic journey to, to provide many more facilities for the communities. So by adopting a joined up approach with key stakeholders, I'm confident that we'll continue to make this positive difference. And through the provision of these fantastic facilities and the clear pathway that we have in place, we'll encourage and enable more people to become active and in doing so achieve wider social outcomes. Next slide, please. So whilst impressive milestones have already been achieved, the exciting challenge lies ahead for all three hubs to deliver the opportunity for thousands of local sportsmen and women, young and not so young, to play on first class facilities week in, week out and provide a base to enjoy in Excel. Thank you. Okay, Victoria, thank you very much indeed. Um, so Ladies and gentlemen, we've got now a panel uh, of people who ask questions. We, we've got both Victoria and Louise who we've heard from, but we've got four additional people who've joined the panel. Um, and I'm going to introduce them now. And I'm get, just so that they, we know who they are, I'm going to ask them, uh, each of the new panelists who we haven't seen before, just one question so that we can, um, we can start things off. So we've got Chris Perks, the Executive Director of Local Delivery at Sport England. Uh, Robert Sullivan, Interim CEO of the Football yeah. Foundation. Jackie Thornton, Head of Development at Norwich City Football Club and Community Sports Trust. And uh, Turan Kapoor, uh, Chair of the Football Foundation Grants Panel, Manchester United Trustee and CEO of the Dean Trust Group of Educational Academies. Um, so can I start, Jackie? Um, just so we get to know who you are, so what's your experience of partnering with local authorities been like in your area? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to be on the call with you all today. Um, and fantastic to see some of the amazing work that everybody is doing across the country. Um, I have to say, this is, this is great to see that we have a roadmap. Um, when we started our project um, some time ago, we didn't have a roadmap. So working with local authorities was far more difficult than having this, um, this set out plan that we've, we've now got. So our facility is um, a £6.3 million um, facility. We purchased a site which was owned by Norwich City Council um, and Norfolk County Council. And it was situated in a Broadland District Council area. So three different local authorities we had to work with um, situated under a, an airport. So lots of challenges to overcome. Um, my experience has been um, that it really is about relationships and people really understanding what your project can deliver. Everybody's talked so far about the amazing work and the impact that you can have about being multi-sports what we were um, trying to get across to people is how many people we could engage with and, and how we could turn a derelict facility into an amazing facility. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Jackie. And um, we've just lost Tim Hollings, uh, but we've got other colleagues from Sport England here uh, who will come to in a minute. Um, Taryn, can I come to you next? Um, for 20 years, you've been chairing the Football Foundation's grants panel. Lots of people on this call will want to know what to do right to make sure that they get their bids accepted. What advice can you give local authority audiences for securing investment towards sports infrastructure in their area? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me today. 20 years has been a long time. We've moved from being uh, an organisation who had some money without the real strategy to an organisation that has an absolutely clear strategy with the local football plans and with great officers in the field. And my advice always is ask the questions, go on the website to find out the details and then engage with one of the Football Foundation officers to look at the feasibility and to start to gather together a plan because the, every plan should be based on the football development and sports plan, not initially on the finances. Because 
that's what it's all about. And my day job is about that. I'm lucky I'm on one side delivering grants and on the other side, seeing young people and adults benefiting in every single way. And just very quickly, um, last week, we were also disappointed a brand new facility near to us. We got the WhatsApp to say we can't play. This bunch of over 50s were devastated like the bunch of under sixes. And it's about making communication open very, very quickly. That's what I would start with. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, Robert, next. Um, can you give us some insights into, into how the LFFPs were put together and why they are so important? Thanks, Gerard. Morning, everybody. Yes, extremely important, as um, everybody said already in this call. Um, they are the roadmap. They are the way in which we will identify the specific projects we're going to invest in and deliver those brilliant community outcomes um, across all of your areas. What we did was we gathered a bunch of facility investment experts and they, they went into an, every single local authority in turn and did a deep dive into what the football uh, specific needs were, mapping the supply and demand of the game, the opportunities for growth across the different sectors of the game, and then talk to the local stakeholders, the local authorities, the local football uh, clubs and community groups, county FAs, to really get under the skin of, skin of what was possible um, and that's where we came out with um, what I like to call sometimes the shopping list. And every local authority now has its shopping list prioritised of, of what we think will and know um, every time will transform grassroots football in their areas. Robert, thanks very much indeed. Um, finally introduce Chris, um, who's let back just in the nip of time uh, from Sport England. Um, Chris, what are the opportunities to use investment in football facility to support other sports and other forms of physical activity? Thanks, Gerald, and, and morning, everybody. Of course, although we're majoring on football facilities here, um, the facilities that the foundation enable can benefit other sports and activities, and we've heard some examples of that, and many of you will know that. So I think we encourage colleagues to think more widely about other sports and activities and, and to point to the collaboration that uh, Louise described in terms of a good, honest and joined up conversation about how any facility, how any multi-sports facility can speak to a number of activities and crucially become that viable part of a local community which, uh, which is needed for sustainability. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Okay, um, we've got some questions that have come in. Um, so, can I do the first one? Is from Paul Miller. Uh, are all local authorities required to have local football facilities plans? And at which tier, county or district, do these plans apply? I'm a councillor in East Devon and I'm unaware of any strategy we have. East Devon has one large football facility in particular, currently partly derelict with the change room was unusable, which would benefit from funding to bring it back to life. Who would like to jump in first, colleagues? Should, should I take that, Gerald? Yeah. Um, so good news for Paul. Um, the plan's done at a district level, so we have 300 and, circa 318, I think, in total. Uh, and East Devon does have a local football facility plan, which has been completed. On there, Paul, you'll find we've identified um, potential for three new artificial grass pitches to invest in an improvement of 21 uh, natural grass pitches to a, I think it's around the combined cost of five million pounds of investment we want to target into your area in the next few years. So um, hopefully that's good news. Um, get your, get, if I were you, get your teams go away and make sure they've got their, um, got their eyes and ears on that and then to engage with the Football Foundation officers in the area to uh, start bringing that to life and having the important conversations we need to do next. Okay, anybody else would like to jump in or are we happy with Robert's answer? No, everybody's happy, great. Okay, next one is from Caroline Roche. Uh, when can we start assessing the funding for the LFFPs and what is the process? Also, if the investment wasn't identified in the plan, can we still apply for funding? Who wants to leap in? I suspect it may be me again. Okay. Um, well. <laughs> so, yeah, 
whilst the plans are very much the specific pro projects we have prioritised, I think we are we're very uh, flexible to the fact that if new projects come online, which um, may not have been feasible at the time of writing the plans, we, we wouldn't dismiss them if they're clearly going to deliver great football outcomes for your community. So there is always going to be a level of um, flexibility about um, which projects come forward and uh, the order in which they do so. So yes, we would, we, we would be willing to do that. In terms of funding, um, th this is all about working together and having the conversations at that local level. So the Football Duck Foundation has um, um, a significant level of national funding that comes from the government and football authorities. What we want to do now is work with each of you in turn in your local areas to identify the best projects which will deliver the best outcomes. And when we do that, we will begin the conversation with you about how to match fund those at a local level. That means we get the best results and we can share, share and spread the value of what we're trying to bring across nationwide. Okay, Robert, anybody like to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I would. I'll, when we're looking okay. at the submissions on the panel, we, we interrogate the submission in terms of the outcomes. And it's not just the outcomes of football per se, it's the regeneration of a community, it's the disability football, the growth in different areas, and how we can be inclusive. And sometimes the, the submissions are on the fringe of the football plans, but they're so good that we will support them because it is about what's best for that community. And there has to be a plan, which is great, and that's the strategy, but it doesn't preclude some of the fantastic pieces of work that come into us. So just to make people feel a little bit better about that, it isn't a fix up that only certain places can have funding. It's everything is looked on its own merits. Okay. All right. Um, thanks. I, I think the next one might be for Chris. Um, is how can we demonstrate the impact of the two billion pounds across the country? Thanks, Gerald. Um, well, clear, I think clearly there's um, this works at a number of levels. So within the kind of an overall monitoring and evaluation approach, there'll be individual project um, evaluation approaches. I think, as we've heard from you know, two case studies, um, there's there's an assessment to be done about the value at a whole local authority level or, or in a community level and then those things will add up into an overall evaluation of the impact you know across the whole piece but i would also say it's important that those are in two uh, number of dimensions clearly more participation is, is is crucial and we need to understand that secondly the wider outcomes being delivered are an important part of that framework and thirdly, and again, the, the two presentations pointed to this, the wider value in this way of working, the more collaborative, the more uh, join on of the dots of facilities and opportunities, the more deep collaboration with communities, there's also value in, in learning in that. And I think as a system and a sector, we're just um, starting to use that more and more in all of our work, of which we've heard two great examples today. Okay. All right. Anybody want to add? No? Okay. Um, I've got a whole series more questions, so we'll, we'll keep planning through, and I hope that these, these help, help with people. Um, so the next one is, I think it's from Councillor Miller. Um, are all councils required to have a local football facility plan, and in which place do they tier do they apply? I think we've, we've done that one. My apologies. Um, I think we've done that one, haven't we, Robert? Yeah, yep. OK, sorry. Nick Olson, are football clubs in Wales included in this or not? If not, can we lobby the Welsh Government to introduce it? OK, I'll, I'll do that one. Um, so there are no local football facility plans for Wales. Um, the Football Foundation's main remit is for English football. However, we do work with some of our Premier League funding with community um, club community organisations in Wales, the clubs that play in the English leagues, if that makes sense. So we do projects with um, Cardiff in the community. I think the House of Sport was a project we did with them recently uh, and the other clubs, the Swansea, etc. So 
I'm afraid uh, we're not responsible for local football facility plans in Wales and um, whether you want to lobby the Welsh Government or not, and that, by all means. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think we should probably stray into that any further, otherwise <laughs> we may get into trouble um, about devolution. Um, uh, the next one is slightly more prosaic for us, um, from Alan Williams. To protect the investment and to provide safe and sustain sustainable grass spaces, we often need fencing, which can be, difficult, can be a difficult sell on public open spaces. Can the FA and the Football Foundation help promote this message? Chris, do you want to go first? Um, I think it's probably a, maybe a Martin or a Rob one. I would have thought. Yeah. Joe. Okay. Yeah. No. I, Fine. I think I think it's um, it's all part of the. Um, it, for me, it's all part of the facility mix in any given location, which is identifying where in your area we need to invest in open park space and where we need to be building uh, football specific pitches, which have that that those levels of kind of uh, fencing and protection. But I mean, I. I personally would be supportive of that, but um, I guess it's in the balance of what every council must consider about balancing off its open space and its recreational space. Okay, um, Louise, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, th I think it's really important that engagement with local communities right from the start. Um, I think you know it's important to do that and uh, we, we've obviously engaged with local football clubs but it's actually the neighbours and the people who might use it for dog walking at other times so it's it's uh, making the people local people feel that it's their facility as well as the football's facility and I think if you do that and they understand why that fencing's there I think that will make it easier um, I can't understate how important that local engagement is okay all right, and uh, Victoria? I would just absolutely echo that. The, the process that we went through that started, you know, a number of years ago for the development of our football hubs, engagement with the communities was an absolute priority for these exact reasons, whether it was, you know, we have one of our hubs that we had to relocate a bridal path and it, it, the bridal path is would have now been right through the middle of a, one of the pitches. So we had to engage very early on, but in doing that, it meant when we got to planning that there wasn't any ob objection. So absolutely engagement with communities and those near neighbours of any facility is, is critical. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next one is from Councillor Bellamy. If we're looking at 3G as a virtuous investment to provide facilities, health returns and a financial return, what sort of annual revenue in terms of financial returns could we expect from a 3G pitch to support stretch council budgets? Well, should I speak from the foundation side and then maybe yep. uh, Victoria could speak from the hub experience in Sunderland. But from our perspective, um, we would start with any 3G potential development with the, um, the usage plan and the potential outcomes we want to regain from that that would have to reflect a level of pricing that was appropriate for football usage in that community. So there's no point uh, building a site and then pricing people out who would normally um, be regularly participating at a certain pricing level. From that, we would then look at the numbers and see whether it was sustainable. And there's a really important element that um, we need to remember here, which is we also require uh, the operators or the owners of the, of the new facility to be putting away funding for what we call the sinking fund, so the replacement of the artificial pitch carpet in eight to 10 years uh, of, of usage. So in the round, once we've understood all of those numbers, you then, you then have a returns level and it's up for um, a discussion with the, with the Football Foundation team to work out, is that sustainable? What kind of payback does that give to, to the council for their, if it's a local authority investment? And is that something that we're all comfortable that uh, can move forward? Okay, I, th I think my experience in Portsmouth has been, I think we've made mistakes over the years in terms of pitches we put in 3Gs, etc. Uh, we have one area of the city, which is a very, very poor area, um, where we built the pitch in a school, but, but it wasn't on the edge of the plot, so that uh, whenever anybody wants to use it, they have to fund the caretaker to be able to, 
to be able to go and unlock it. And, and it just means that the, the people who live in the tower blocks around it, who are a very, very poor community, can look down on it, but they can't afford to use it. Um, and it's used by middle class people from, from outside their area, and it's not part of their community. So we're now making sure that they're built on the edge of plots on school sites so that somebody just needs a key to open the, the gate to come in from the, from the, the pavement, um, because that makes it much more available to other people. Okay, um, something, uh, oh, sorry, Victoria. And just just quickly to build on on what Robert was saying, I think it's really difficult to say one one pitch will equal X revenue because it's about that holistic approach. So the work that we did was looking at the facility mix. So if you're looking at more than than one, it's looking at how one may be might provide more revenue, but another might not for various reasons. But if you look at it in the whole, um, that's that's the model that, that we've done. But I think it's, it's again, very important. The starting point for us was looking at the price points that we currently had, because there was no, you know, not just from grass pitches that the, the local authority maintain and, and have higher arrangements on, but also what our, our other providers within the city, because it is about fundamentally, it is about increasing participation, so we don't want to make it really difficult for anyone else to be able to provide a football offer. Um, so it's about making sure that we had a had a, had a baseline that was affordable for all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, this is a question from Paul Stacey to Sport England. Uh, we would you to consult on our playing pick strategy, but the consultation process is not feasible during... COVID. Is there any guidance on how to approach this? Chris? Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Gerald, and thanks, Paul. I mean, the first thing to say, Paul, is, you know, be very happy to hook up outside of the meeting on this specifically. Um, we are, we're aware, we're aware of, obviously, the, the constraints at the moment. We're discussing it amongst our planning team, um, because obviously it's coming up in a number of areas. And we have some, some quite innovative approaches, actually, from places who have continued to consult and engage different parts of their community about playing pitch provision by using engagement that exists already you know other 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 things that are set up or other reasons for talking to communities or, or, or for more sport locally they're using that in different ways i'd be happy to share what some of those ideas are and maybe we could speak offline and as i say it's something our um, planning team are um you know are actively considering at the moment for all the reasons we can appreciate Okay, anything to add from anybody? No? Okay. Um, next one is from Ed Kelsings. Um, can the Football Foundation and Sport England uh, give any guidance on the level of funding that could be available for, for projects prior to them being accepted? Or has this got to happen um, after planning has been granted on a scheme? Uh, no, we, we provide a small amount of project development cost funding, circa up to £10,000 for a project. So we can help with that early stage development and work with you to bring it to the point where it can go for submission for assessment. Okay. Anybody else? No, no. Okay, that's very quick and to the point. Um, <laughs> that's um, so I've now got a, another series. So um, um, as a local authority asset manage, manager, um, no, okay, I'm, so this, sorry, I'm going to slightly translate. How do we receive details of the funding that's available for us and local authorities and our tenant sports association to improve our pitches and other facilities? How do we apply and is match funding available? Robert, yeah, I think yeah. that might be you. It is indeed. Um, so the starting point is your local football facility plan, which will be emailed to every local authority today and is available on the Football Foundation website. Once you've been through that, and hopefully the projects now will be familiar to you, next step is to engage with the Football Foundation's uh, delivery team for your area, and they will start the conversation about which of those projects that can be prioritised and put in an order of, 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 of investment. And then as those projects are developed through um, to application, the funding conversation will start and each one will be assessed at the appropriate level of match funding that 
the local community and or the local authority will need to provide. I mean, to give you a range, we, we normally expect between 30 to 40 percent local match funding per project. Okay. Anybody else? Um, Taryn, are you, Taryn, you're on mute. Just most standard saying, I do apologize. <laughs> we have a fine system. I now have to put a pound in a box here. So that's going to change me. I'll have to fess up to that later on. Well, as, long as, it, as long as it goes into Pompey in the community, everybody will be happy. What I was going to say is that um, in some of the areas where it's quite difficult for some people to have the, the wherewithal to write a bid, we were able to utilise consultants to help them to move the pr process from start to finish because the bid will be so good, but it's just pulling it together. So people shouldn't worry too much. The foundation are really good at uh, allocating people to support you to write the bid. It isn't, you're not on your own, even as a local authority. I think that's a really important point to make. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've, I've got a very short question, um, which is where, from Kate, where do I find the local plans for the district? I presume the answer is with the district council. Um, or do they come to, to, to you, Robert, um, or to Taryn or whoever? Robert, do you so want to let us know? They're going to be emailed to each, um, each district council today. And uh, forgive me, I don't know the exact uh, recipient of each councillor who will get them. But the good news is they're on the Football Foundation website. So okay. there's a, an easy way of going and searching for your, for your district and all the information will be there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one is an anonymous attendee. Um, and it's got some, some slight politics in it, but I, I think I'm going to read it as it is because... It's not part, well, anyway, as a large grassroots club with 115 teams, we have a very supportive conservative borough council and our required investment is prioritised in the LFFP. However, our facilities are owned by the conservative county council who are proposing to sell our home ground for housing or schools, which currently no proposal for an alternative venue. How do stakeholders, councils and governments engage better, closer and more consistently so that situations like this don't happen and grassroots like ours can deliver the LFFP? Who would like to tread carefully around that one? I, I, Robert, are you volunteering? Well, if I may, can I avoid the politics and give an operation? Completely. I, I think the only point of the politics is that both layers of the council are run by the same party and it's I, not an inter-party fight. I see. Uh, I was going to give a purely operational answer, which is, um, I think you said it was anonymous, but if the individual wanted to um, leave, him, who, leave his name and who he is, the Football Foundation team in his area will probably be able to help engage and work out the best way through that particular situation. And that's that. I mean, the I don't know whether the the council, the political people on the call, have a view on how to handle the the difference between the two council views. But operationally, I would suggest we we might be able to help on the ground because a a grassroots club that runs 115 teams needs our support. Um, I think my my reaction would be need to work closely with the the county council to see if you can persuade them to change their minds. At, or at least to offer an alternative site so that a, a, a club with so many people playing, so many kids playing, um, will, be, will be able to find a new home. Um, uh, and remember that um, you've got the point of maximum um, leverage over the next six months um, because there are elections for county councils in May next year. Um, and therefore, they may be more willing to listen over this period that at, at other times. Um, okay, something uh, from Dave Cove. If a scheme at the sports park is multi-sport and includes a 3G pitch plus additional facilities for other sports, 
i.e. improving rugby and hockey facilities, how do we coordinate applications to the Football Foundation of Sport England? Does applying for the Football Foundation preclude applications to Sport England for the same site? Chris, do you want to go first or I can take it? Chris, yes. You're um, on mute, Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll give a non-technical answer, which is, I mean, obviously this has come up before uh, fairly regularly. It's through a good blend of local collaborative discussion and discussion between the foundation and ourselves and our operational teams who all have the local knowledge. I think that's, that's my quick answer. Yeah. We'll work in partnership. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Louise? Yeah, I was just going to say it's about partnership working and our playing pitch strategy includes hockey and rugby. So it's about all working together. And actually, the more you do that, the better life is generally, I've found. So, uh, yeah, partnership all the way. OK. Um, Jackie? Yeah, I was just going to add um, our project is very much a multi-sports approach. Um, and it was very important right from the start. Um, the, the amount of investment and everything that we needed to, to get the project off the ground. It had to make sure that we enabled health and well-being. We run mental health programs. Um, we work very closely with the Premier League Fund to then get funding for projects, education programs. Um, they're really, really important. And if you work together with your local community trust, funded through the Premier League, EFL, all those people, they can help bring those programmes to your site. So if you haven't reached out to your local community club, as well as your grassroots club, I would suggest that you go and talk to them and see what programmes they already have and are delivering, and they will be able to um, bring to your site as well. Um, and that will bring um, significant investment and uh, that sustainability to your project as well as reaching a far wider group of people than just around football. Okay, Taryn? Yeah, some, of the, yeah, some of the best um, projects that we receive have a blend of partners and Sports England are one of those partners. And, and our discussions in panel are very much about, is this a facility that's going to um, in multi-sports, is it going to have the social outcomes? Is it going to have the disability outcomes? It isn't just about football. This is about regeneration, changing the social fabric of areas. And the more partners, the better in our, in our way, because, way of thinking, because everyone has an investment. I think that's, that's really important. Okay, Chris, you, you wanted to come back. Yeah, thank you, Gerald. Um, and I, Tim alluded to this. I mean, only yesterday I was in a virtual room with uh, some of Robert Co Robert's colleagues, um, some of Martin's colleagues, Premier League, EFL Trust. So actually the environment for collaboration, particularly around more of a place-based focus, um, is never greater. Um, and I think that's one of the kind of flip sides of the COVID crisis in many ways, the way the system works together locally and nationally. I think for probably for all the, the right and the wrong reasons, that it's never been more conducive to that way of working and really starting off with local needs, local communities, the outcomes we want and building from that. So I just wanted to point to the environment's very supportive at the moment for ever greater collaboration. That's not to say there'll be some bumps on the road, but I think that's worth saying. Okay. All right, next one's to Victoria. Um, Victoria, you mentioned that car parking was key to the facility's success. Do you have any advice on any planning issues that came across to enable this to happen? Our local planning policy is to drive cars out of the city and reduce parking at every facility and promote more sustainable transport links. Yes, um, and our planning policy is exactly the same. But one of the key things that we did was bring planners into those conversations very, very early on. So with the support of the operations team at the Football Foundation, we did some modelling. We have a huge, in Sunderland, we have a huge um, youth uh, league that has thousands of young people on a weekend playing. Um, and we needed to, you know, this youth league was moving on to these hub sites. So we were very mindful that although we are pushing active travel, sustainable transport, car sharing, all of those areas that everyone will be doing, we still needed to make sure that we could accommodate and at any, you know, at an hour on a Saturday morning, 
we can have you know 700 players parents in their cars and what tends to happen with youth football is it's one car one player one parent so we had to make sure that we had sufficient to accommodate and that didn't cause problems to the neighbours within those vicinities because otherwise all that happens is those cars won't park in a, a local residential area which just then causes us problems so absolutely driving cars out of our city is equally a priority but we had to be mindful of where these hubs were located and access to public transport etc but i would say bring your planners into the conversations early on and they can they can help with some of the modeling as well Thank you. okay anybody else for that one no okay N next one is from richard lloyd uh, does the lffp or any other scheme bring any legal requirement on local authorities to provide facilities i'm in a situation as a town council leader trying to deliver desperately needed and entirely evidence-based new facilities, but with a resistant local authority who prioritise neither sport nor sports facilities. This is making securing land extremely difficult. Who wants to go and... Uh, that, Robert, you look as if you're desperate to answer <laughs> that one. Uh, it doesn't come with a legal obligation, no, is the, is the short answer. The slightly long, longer answer is um and it's back to a, a lot of what we've already said which is it's a means of fo the, the plan is a means of corralling and fostering partnership and engagement locally and what we hope is with those plans and our ability to bring people around the projects it will help you gather momentum and support for those projects and and it, what it will do is obviously feed directly into uh, playing pitch strategies which then obviously have a far le higher level of traction uh, in the legal sense around um and local authority decision making. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. Somebody. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, but I'll try to get through a couple more. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Hello. Great session, and good to hear about other sports and activities benefiting. I assume this includes recreational football facilities too. I presume you have to have football to qualify for this, don't you? Yes. Yeah, that was a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, next one. Um, to secure potential Football Foundation funding, do you have to ha follow the Football Foundation's procurement process? Also, can, your pa can you package up a number of LFFP proposals and it's just moved? Um, uh, can I find that one again? No, um, that seems to have disappeared off there. Can you package several of them up together in, into one thing from several local authorities? Uh, Taryn, I think you're probably the person to um, be able to instruct us on that. Well, I, I can start that off. It, you would normally have a package, <coughs> excuse me, a package of um, uh, pitches or facilities from one local authority. They tend to work within the authority because that's where the plan is. It's quite unusual and I don't think I've come across it where two local authorities would work together to create their own plan. So we tend to work within authorities unless it's a freestanding application. So I don't know if uh, Robert wants to come in, but that yeah. is how yeah, that works. That, that's right, Tony. I think the answer to the question about packaging, the conversation we would love to have with all of you is how to approach these plans for your area in, in that combined holistic sense. So yes we can work down the list doing one at a time but what we'd really like to do is agree with you um a sequencing and an order and a way of funding them all together that way we can make big jumps rather than little jumps so that's absolutely in our in our ambition on the on the procurement framework so the answer to that is with 3g pitches yes you do need to use our procurement framework because that's why we have it because we want to drive down costs and get the right level of quality on those facilities on other um on other things that you may be um seeking funding for we're more flexible to local um providers contractors and the good relationships you may have on other projects that you want to take advantage of okay louise yeah i just wanted to come in that's a really interesting concept uh, i noticed in the chat before there was a question from someone from the wirral which is our neighboring authority 
And I know that there's um, pitches um, that in, are in our plan that teams from Wirral come and play on. So I think that fluidity, because people, you know, residents don't think, oh, I'm going into another area now. Can I play on that pitch? So I think I think there's really interesting conversations. And, and Robert, if you want to look at something, there might be something we could do with the Wirral, because they're just at the start of their journey and we've got lots of experience. So I, I think there's potential there. Something. Um, if, you know, if, if, if local authorities can come together, pull their resources and their thinking, recognise the fact that football players, you know, do drive out of <laughs> the soup boundaries occasionally, um, I think that would be fantastic because it would just allow us to move quicker and delivering what we want. Excellent. Jackie? Uh, I was just going to come in just in terms of um, the procurement route with um, the framework. Um, it's very supportive that the staff at the foundation are, are really helpful in enabling you to get through that process, um, which is fantastic. We, we did separate ours out as well. We have two contractors who are currently building on, on our site. Um, so we, we had our, our contractor through the Football Foundation and then we had a local contractor went through that tender process. Um, so it can be done and quite, quite well, as long as the communication between the two teams um, to deliver your project on time, on budget. Great, okay. Well, colleagues, we've got, just got a couple of minutes left. So I think I'm just gonna wind up by saying thank you to, to all the panelists and everybody who's made this possible. I think this is a great contribution that Football Foundation are making to grassroots sport across the country and working with councils to deliver. It's really, really important. Um, I know when I talk to my, my local football teams that the quality of pitches is, is a real problem for them. And having four, three, four G pitches around and um, really good artificial pitches will be absolutely brilliant for them. I also know when they have so many other bits that are useful, the, the informal play, youth, youth groups using them to be able to make sure there's something constructive for young people to do. Uh, I know in, in my ward, uh, Football Foundation put some money in and the youth project um, there um, uh, a couple of years ago had a, a thousand different named kids turning up every month. Uh, and from not just my wall, but from quite a wide area. And that's made a huge difference. Um, inevitably, I'm biased. I think Pompey and the community are wonderful as a community organisation. And the way in which they are able to work with young people to get them back into education, to get them interested in, uh, in, in reading. Um, and for, for kids, if they're not going to school, instead of getting a text message from their head teacher, getting a text message from one of the players at the club, one of their heroes, to tell them they need to be at school because they need to be doing, doing the stuff to get their qualifications. So I think there's huge benefits for all of us uh, from working together between health, councils and 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 the football uh, foundation of sport england and our local clubs so thank you very much indeed for everybody uh, for being involved today um, thank you very much indeed for the lga for setting this up uh, i hope it's been a, an interesting and constructive hour and a half um, and goodbye <laughs>